continue our series entitled League of Women Voters Empowering You, a program designed by the League of Women Voters in partnership with Dayton Access Television to provide unbiased, nonpartisan information on issues that are relevant to our friends and neighbors throughout the greater Dayton area. My name is David Votary. I am a member of the League of Women Voters and your host for today's program as we discuss water quality and natural resources. The League of Women Voters mission focuses as much on education as it does on voting and some of the positions include government, social policy, and natural resources. So we really focus today on that natural resources aspect, specifically on water quality. Our guests today are Leslie King, director of the Rivers Institute at the University of Dayton Fitz Center for Leadership and Community. She serves also on several boards, including Five Rivers Metro Parks Foundation, the Miami Valley, or yes, the, the Bike Miami Valley and Partners for the Environmental as well as the Environmental Justice Academy Steering Committee. I'm sure I got some of those wrong, but thank you and welcome. Thank you, David. Thank you for having us. Yeah. And her guest, or our guest <laughs> together, is Tessa O'Halloran, a University of Dayton now junior mm -hmm. who has been working with the River Stewards. She is majoring in engineering and she has interned with the Rivers Institute last year and this year is working with the Miami Conservancy District this summer. Thank so you. welcome Tessa. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I want to remind our viewers about the rivers and why five rivers is a relevant expression, not just because of the parks, but because there are five rivers that converge in mm -hmm. Dayton. And those rivers, I had to remind myself, are the Great Miami, the Mad River, the Stillwater River, Wolf Creek, and Twin Creek. And these rivers all feed into the Great Miami, Buried Val uh, the Great Miami um, Valley Aquifer, which is essentially Savile and Grand, uh, sa sand and gravel mm -hmm. beneath us, mm -hmm. right, that has um, taken in all this water and it's just resting there or mm -hmm. sitting there. Um, so an aquifer, mm -hmm. according to the city of Dayton, holds as many as a trillion gallons of, wa mm -hmm. of water beneath us. With that understanding that rivers are converging, and that's really why Dayton is mm -hmm. here in many ways, because early on transportation relied on those rivers. But now the rivers are important to us for other reasons. And so, Leslie, tell us about the Rivers Institute and what is your connection to the rivers? Yeah, so I think um, Dayton has always been a confluence, like you said, even before Dayton was Dayton. It was a confluence of rivers where people came together and settled, and it was around the river. And so the Rivers Institute was formed, I'd say 15, a little over 15 years ago, when community partners like Miami Conservancy District um, and other community leaders came to the University of Dayton and said, you know, the rivers and our aquifer are a, a incredibly strategic and valuable resource and asset um, to our region. And not just economically valuable, but valuable in all ways. Right. Um, ecologically, aesthetically, socially, and economically. Um, and they asked the University of Dayton to do something. Like, how can we partner and collaborate around the rivers? Um, and what happened was a year-long dialogue with many stakeholders, including students, mm -hmm. to, ta to have that discussion. And, and the Rivers Institute, the River Stewards Program, came out of that because what was realized was that um, based on our history, um, the Great Flood, which was a very long time ago at this point, and we have incredible flood protection um, that protects us from flooding, mm -hmm. and then later history with industrial pollution that most mm -hmm. post-industrial cities faced, right, with pollution, sure. free Clean Water Act, um, we had turned our back on the river completely. Um, we built earthen levee walls to, to protect us, which also separate us, mm -hmm. um, and so there was a true opportunity to say, what would our community and region look like if we looked back at the river? as a true source of, of vitality. Right. Um, and I think what we're seeing today in the region is an outcome of those conversations early on. Um, and there's all kinds of organizations that have done incredible work to get us to where we are today. Um, the Rivers Institute, the University of Dayton, just played a supportive and anchoring role where we were able to um, be at the table 
um, provide the resources that we could, mm -hmm. be it students, faculty, um, research, or even just an anchor institution like UD right. saying the river's important. Right, absolutely. Because it runs through our campus. So um, that it's not just the parks district that's worried about it, but that more people begin to be yeah. worried about it. And Tessa, mm -hmm. you've been involved a couple summers now mm -hmm. on some projects connected to the rivers. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you've been doing. Um, so, of course, so I started as a river steward this sophomore year, and I'm going to be a junior. Um, especially, I think, when we've been talking, and like you were talking about, like, looking back at the river and like the resources that the river gives Dayton. We did a project this last spring where we did made a video for Dayton's uh, Water Festival oh. and we asked uh, University of Dayton students what's the number one resource, like natural resource in Dayton and not a single person naturally gave us water. Everyone said coal, uh, gravel, <laughs> sand, no one said water really? and so just yeah, no one said it. And then, so, I don't know, that was one of the projects we did. There was so many. We have, like, river cleanups. Uh -huh. um, we do, we even, like, do outside or, like, water-based things. We, like, last semester we went to, like, a literacy event at Gem City Market. There's a whole array of things that river stewards do right. that a lot of them do evolve around, though, um, like, environmental justice. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so you got involved in that through UD, but specifically, was it through your major, or were any majors able to join the River Stewards? Any majors are welcome to join River Stewards. I did get a civil engineering major, like email blast, that I know is like from my counselor, okay, right. so that's how I've learned about River Stewards. And is that your area of civil? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. But other majors then could also join yes. the River Stewards? We try to bring in as many different majors as possible. And so we, we try to be able to say we have over 20 majors, 25 okay. majors. We try to represent every academic discipline. Um, the goal is to say what, what can we, what can happen if we put a very diverse group of people together, you know, academically, discipline-wise, um, and demographically, all kinds of diversity, and think through some of these um, challenges we have around water. You Absolutely. Know, as far as solutions go. And these are complex problems, so yeah. you have a variety, a, a diverse group yeah. of people who can look at it and they can begin to kind of then come up with systemic kinds of change as opposed to a band-aid that fixes it from a civil perspective, right, civil engineering right. perspective, but maybe we fail to communicate it effectively from a PR perspective or something else. So you get all those pieces together, it can work better. I love it. Water is essential to life, and yet students at UD didn't recognize water as being a resource. So mm -hmm. that's, I think upon reflection, then they'll be like, well, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also central to our enjoyment in the community. Uh -huh. From either of your perspectives, what are some of the risks that we face with respect to the rivers or to our waterways? Um, as far as recreation goes and then out enjoying them, I mean, I think as we move into summer, it, it's, you know, first and foremost um, important to talk about being safe on the water. Absolutely. Period. Um, and life vests, right? And so there have already been many incidents, you know, across the country and summer's barely started. Sure. Of, of challenges um, on the rivers, people not wearing life vests. So I'd say first and foremost, we have amazing rivers to get out and enjoy. They're family friendly, but you gotta wear a life vest. You gotta be safe. Period, you have to be safe. Other than that, moving into the summer months, I think most um, paddlers mm -hmm. are aware that, you know, if it's really hot and we don't have a lot of rain, we get some algae blooms, right, in our region. And so I think it's important to know how to monitor that. Um, if you do go to different websites, you can find information on that as well as um, how the flows of the river and, and other ways to stay safe. Um, so those are, say, the basic things. Um, other than that, you know, there are larger issues people are looking at in the area as far as water quality goes right. in regards to, to PFAS and some other contaminants. That was the one um, I was thinking of, and yeah. we actually, a year ago or so on this program, we did take a look at PFAS. Yeah. Uh, and we, since then, have been reading about some wells that were uh, registering with higher levels of PFAS, and so then there's some mitigation that's got to be considered, and yeah. what are we going to do about it? And, and more importantly, perhaps, how do we ensure that it doesn't happen again? Right. right? So in terms of uh, the systems or the policies that allow those things yeah. to happen, and then 
how do we change that so it doesn't happen again? Yeah, yeah and I think um, we're really lucky to have an incredibly proactive municipality with the city of Dayton's Department of Water and Environmental Quality. They're, um, they have a history of being so proactive on protecting the aquifer. Um, and so I think they are taking a lead on that and um, really putting pressure on where those contaminants are coming from, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's from industry or, you know, often sometimes our largest employer. Right. So like you said, it's complex. Yeah, it's very complex. Right. Um, but I think the goal would be, you know, that everyone understands that the shared vision is to have clean, safe drinking water. Right. Mm -hmm. For a long time. Yeah, forever. Forever. <laughs> we hope. Um, as you did your internship, do you, or maybe with the River Stewards, do you go out on the waterways as a student? Um, yes. We, I've, we've been on the water a couple times this year, like as a group, as a whole. Um, all the River Stewards, we went a couple times in the fall mm -hmm. and weekly, Saturday and Sundays, oh. the outdoor recreational. Um, uh, the like I don't know what, what you call outdoor rack at UD yeah. they host free kayaking oh, on nice. Saturdays and Sundays uh -huh. so at Old River Park so Good. yeah and even Riverscape I feel like a lot of people students uh -huh. are usually there and so Old River Park viewers mm -hmm. will remember being the NCR facility but now that's owned by Dayton is that mm -hmm. right yeah mm -hmm. University of Dayton mm -hmm. so I'm sorry I yeah. in my head but but so then that is actually a space that you can access and utilize um, as students, which mm -hmm. is really cool. Yeah. Uh, what about in terms of environmental kind of pollutants and things like that? When you're out on the rivers, do you see the trash that mm -hmm. people yeah. have neglected to properly care for? And what are the things you notice most? Mm -hmm. um, when we done, when we have done river cleanups, we've seen honestly like bottles of alcohol. That's like a one thing that I don't know. We definitely would pick up just like empty bottles. Yeah. Um, actually like gallons of gasoline or some type of oil we I've picked up like at least four of those those are wow. like really common um, I'm trying to think what other a lot of plastic just like plastic bottles soda cans water bottles um, most people I feel like don't realize especially a lot of the drains that in our communities they dump to the river mm -hmm. and they don't go through like some sort of cleaning process right. and I see I always see on campus kids just like dump things down there and so huh. but those are probably the most like the bottles glass bottles and plastic bottles right mm -hmm. um, and and it's I guess so obvious and yet somehow it's not evidently not obvious mm -hmm. to everyone uh, you know in terms of the way that I approach my own living mm -hmm. uh, yeah if I brought it into the car I'm not going to toss it out of the car mm -hmm. I'm going to take it with me mm -hmm. to then wherever if it's to my own trash can or mm -hmm. to a recycling bin or whatever so those are basic simple things that we have to mm -hmm. somehow find a way to ensure people understand and do consistently mm -hmm. um, there tends to be a lot of trash along the levee walls after mm -hmm. a heavy rain so after sure. the river goes down all that trash is there and it's a great time for anyone to go out with a trash bag and, and pick it up before another heavy rain comes and, and takes it and down again. It and so, down. you know, people seem to not want plastic on beaches, right? Like there's a big, oh, there's plastic on the beaches, microplastics, right? Yeah. But it comes from places like here. And so I think we should care equally as much about the plastic, you know, mm. along our riverbanks. Well, and in fact, if I listen to my favorite singer-songwriter, Jackson Brown, uh, the ocean is downhill from everywhere, right? right? Uh, it's a song he recently released, and the idea that all the things that we just happen to yeah. let drop, right, end up going into the rivers through the waterways, mm -hmm. maybe it's the storm drain or whatever, and then that goes downhill, right? And it keeps going right. downhill, whether it's to a larger mm -hmm. tributary, whether it's out to the lake or wherever, yeah. so, yeah, challenging. Um, yeah. As you think about our waterways, what are the things that concern you most? I would say development is something that really concerns me because any watershed has a tipping point mm -hmm. where if you have, you know, a certain percentage of basically pavement, you know, non-permeable right. services, right. Um, you know, you're kind of past this 
ratio of having a healthy watershed. And so any further development is going to further tip that for us in our watershed, which means um, for the Great Miami River watershed, you know, a lot of the work has been focusing on um, really getting the core towns along the river to revitalize themselves so that we can kind of reinvent them and, you know, kind of redevelop them. They're already developed mm -hmm. um, versus continuing to develop on our farmland and our open space. And so we need to protect and preserve our open space and farmland above all. Um, we need to continue to mitigate getting, keeping the aquifer safe and clean. Right. Um, and then I think we need to get people out to enjoy the water in the river, whether that means a sunset Oh, good. Or um, kayaking if you're into that, but really just watching a sunset on the river, taking a walk on the river, um, can be enough to make you realize that we are special because of our rivers. Really lucky. We're really lucky. Yeah. And it's not just because, um, well, it's for a lot of reasons. And one of the reasons is because more and more with droughts, you know, people don't have water, right? right? And they're going to be rationing. And so not only do we have an abundant amount of water resources. It also makes our region, you know, beautiful and ecologically healthy and a great place to recreate. Absolutely. We can even bike along our rivers, over 300 miles of connected paved bike trails. I'm thinking about so many different directions we could go. I mean, one is that we have this sort of, I don't know, romance with pavement, and I don't right. understand it. <laughs> but, you know, concrete and pavement as if somehow <laughs> there were no other options. Right. Uh, and yet permeable surfaces would allow for more water to be able to um, filter through mm -hmm. as opposed to rush to the culvert down into the waterway, right? So are, I don't even know. Does UD have any engagement with these alternative kinds of permeable surfaces? Is there any research that you know of that's going on or any places that we could turn to that are using those kinds of surfaces? I would say yes. I mean, we use some within our own infrastructure at UD and play around with some green roofs. I think our biggest right. focus now has been solar and energy, which has been great um, at the university. But there is research being done and there is a faculty actually, a couple faculty that focus on research within our watershed in regards to um, climate change and what the greatest impacts we might experience right. with, with climate change. And I think that gets into the question you're asking. I, I think too, and I'm just remembering myself, Cox Arboretum, I think, has one of those permeable surfaces. Mm -hmm. I forget where. Is it by their greenhouses or something? Yeah. I forget. Yeah, and if you look around, you'll notice that most pavers have permeability. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Anything that's just not solid concrete. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know Miami Conservancy District, they have like a little patio area and that's like asphalt that like is allowed to like mm -hmm. soak in water. Oh really? Mm -hmm. So it is possible? Yes. It's just expensive. <laughs> Isn't that, and it's a trade-off, right? Yeah. Because the yeah. expense of not having water to drink right. is the alternative, right? I mean we mm -hmm. could get ourselves into a position where we really cause our own problems. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have to find the balance. Mm -hmm. We could pay for it now or pay for it later. Yeah. Agreed. Um, I do have a brother-in-law in California, and the water issues in California are really scary. Mm -hmm. uh, and not only is it a lack of water for drinking water, but then all the other things that we use water for naturally, right? Uh, and of course, water is also useful in terms of growing the produce that California mm -hmm. is so well known for in terms of producing. So we, we really have to think about this and figure it out. We do. I also, I think, read something about, it was California or Arizona, that they're pulling lawns out. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just removing lawns because they cannot sustain that type of landscape out right. there. Yeah. So, um, once again, we're lucky to have access to all that water. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm curious if there are partners that UD is working with that you want to name uh, that our community would need to or could benefit by knowing more about. I'm guessing Five Rivers. Yeah. Five Metro Rivers Parks. Metro Parks has been an excellent partner. Um, the City of Dayton Water Department mm -hmm. and um, Sustainability Office are mm -hmm. great partners. And we have um, River Steward graduates okay. that are working in those offices oh, right. actually now. And so it's nice to see our graduates, you know, go off and do great things. But a lot, a lot do tend to stay in the region and want to contribute to making our, our watershed and city a better place. Um, Another partner that's been a great partner for us is the Little Miami Watershed Network um, and the work that Hope Taft and her many volunteers um, have out in Greene County and Clark County and 
um, beyond, and they've recently also helped form the Ohio Scenic Rivers Association, oh, okay. since the Little Miami River is a wild and scenic river. And so their work is very community, grassroots driven, and they're a great partner also, um, because the way they approach things is a little different than, um, it's probably a little closer to the way we approach things, um, than our public sector partners, right? And by that, you mean that they would ask about what do we need to be doing, or they would involve their community? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, we don't really have any jurisdiction or authority, right? right. Or a grassroots so organization. So we do things kind of by like, um, you know, large amounts of people, right? Like mm -hmm. how you really create change through a movement of people. Right. So they're, they're a lot like that. And so you said uh, Hope Taft's organization is the Little Miami Watershed Network. Watershed Network. And then, of course, there's Five Rivers Metro Park. So if people are looking to volunteer uh -huh. to do some sort of river cleanup or uh -huh. to, in other ways, environmental kind of yes. sustainability, they could turn to those organizations. Yes, and, and they have a huge river cleanup June 11th on the Little Miami mm -hmm. River that okay. people could contribute to. That's excellent. And um, there's also a couple new groups that people should be aware of. The um, Great Dayton Cleanup started during COVID as a way to get oh. people outside. And this um, community leader, this just initiated an amazing amount of trash being taken out of the river. So you could probably find his cleanups on Facebook, um, the Great Dayton Cleanup. And then now there's Surf Dayton, oh, right. right? That is really actually kind of creating a um, Ohio River Surfing Association and, and they're developing a stewardship approach to keeping the rivers clean since they're in them when they right. surf. Yeah. They're in them way more than a <laughs> kayaker. <laughs> right. They're really in the river. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. That's very So cool. they're new up and coming groups. That's so exciting. Um, what about from a government or a policy perspective? Are there things that through your work you've come to understand are need our attention? Uh, things that you know, maybe people are not aware of other than maybe our city of Dayton folks. Are there any policies or government kinds of levels of activity that we should be thinking about? I, I think people should be aware where their water comes from. And then they're, therefore they should be aware of what kind of um, policies are put in place to protect their water. Right. And so we do have good policies, but that doesn't mean they're gonna be there forever, right? So you have right. to think about that, that power you have as a voter and how we need informed leaders, right? right. Um, and so we have the Wellfield Preservation District. Yes. We have the um, Aquifer Sub Preservation District. Um, and so there are a couple different laws and policies in place that do control what happens over our well fields, right? Mm -hmm. yep. But those could change. Um, innovative strategies, I think, would be interesting for people to take a look at would be this concept of how rivers, lakes, waters ha have rights. Mm, right. Right. And so we've seen that in some countries happen, right? We've seen that, you know, almost happen in Toledo around the Lake Erie water crisis. Um, we've Costa seen it in Rica the approaches Costa Rica, Costa Rica, New yeah. Zealand, Bolivia. So there are examples of that. And I think it's worth thinking about how our aquifer could potentially look at that because of the fact that it has the potential to provide right. safe, clean drinking water for so many people for so long. Right. It, it's, it's almost a social responsibility. Right. Well, and it we have. harkens back to a Native American perspective as well. So mm -hmm. uh, given the land that we exist on, right, which really isn't ours to begin with, uh, right. but our Native American ancestors would remind us that right, right. this is, belongs and I'm so glad you brought that up because that's why I started by saying, you know, long before we called it Dayton, yeah. this was always a confluence of five rivers. And um, it was supposedly a place of peace because of that, mm. because um, native tribes knew oh, there converge. was so much crossing here oh. that it couldn't necessarily be. I just got chills. It, was, it had to be a crossing of, of paths and right. a place of peace, a confluence of peace. That's so cool. So. I'm we glad have you shared that. Museum, right? yeah. Uh, yeah, one of the few places that has a peace museum in the nation. Yeah, yeah I learned that from Guy Jones, who's a Lakota elder in town, who right. you probably know. I know. Yeah. That's super cool. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, I'm glad you shared that. He's a great partner as well for the Rivers so Institute. From, from a student's perspective, 
Um, I didn't ask if you were a Dayton native or if you moved to Dayton to come to UD. I'm from Homer Glen, Illinois. Okay, so yeah. out of state. Yeah, out of state. You've come to this region. Mm -hmm. as, as a person who's come to UD and has now come to appreciate the rivers, anything else that you want to share or any perspectives that you think that we should be aware of? Um, yeah, I mean, I've grown up, my dad's always like enforced in me that like water's one of the most important aspects of life. He's always said that like Lake Michigan is one of the most important mm -hmm like resources we have because that's where that's where my watershed is mm -hmm. um compared to like but when you talk about like laws and policies i know there was recently like a bill hb 175 with about streams that like these streams that don't technically have water in them all year round mm -hmm. but right. will in the uh in the spring probably. yeah in the yeah. spring now mm -hmm. it's it hasn't been signed by the governor yet last that I've heard last week, but now the bill wants to change it. They're not going to be considered streams anymore. So people can like lay concrete. So like Leslie said, like, so we do have laws in place, but they can always change. Right. So uh -huh. just being like aware of constant news and being um, mm -hmm. just like proactive. I know we had the river stewards, we had a service opportunity, Hope Taft helped us with it. And we got all the, uh, I don't know, like the counselors, um, addresses and mailing addresses and we all wrote them letters right. about HB 175. Good. Mm -hmm. That's so cool that you're involved and you're engaged and you know mm -hmm. about that. I wasn't familiar with that but mm -hmm. uh, I, I will learn more now and mm -hmm. I'll check that out. Mm -hmm. So um, and I'm sure a lot of it has to do with the development right because people somehow want new homes as opposed yeah. to uh, yep. finding spaces in some of the older homes or something else but um, mm -hmm. yeah it's a challenge and we point. have to find the balance I mm -hmm. think. Any last That's thoughts as we wrap things up? Um, I, I would just, you know, I would just say there's a lot of opportunity for people to understand, you know, the value of our water and rivers here. Um, Tess is going to be a little modest, but I'll go ahead and put it out there that she's also an artist. And um, the river stewards, you know, termed this mm -hmm. concept river love about 15 years ago. And it, mm -hmm. it's really um, this essence. It's this feeling, right? And it's... It, there's no exact definition. It's whatever it means to you, right? right? And so another project Tessa worked on this year was um, developing a logo for that and stickers. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so maybe you'll see those on T-shirts soon mm -hmm. where you can um, buy a River Love T-shirt or sticker. And another one is Be Like Water. Mm. And what we're trying to do is kind of get Dayton to understand this is who we are. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. We have water, we have rivers, and um, it's something to really promote. Mm -hmm. But just like the fish in the water, it's around us so much, I think we forget about yes. it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just like your students at UD, right? They mm -hmm. probably have been on the river, but they forgot about it as a resource. Mm -hmm. They certainly are drinking the water, but they forgot about it as a resource. So uh, mm -hmm. I guess we have to be like, not like the fish, but like the water, right? And yeah. Actually... And maybe appreciate it before it doesn't come on one no. morning. That's right. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to uh, thank you, Leslie, director of the Rivers Institute at the University of Dayton Fitz Center uh, for leadership in the community, and Tessa O'Halloran, mm -hmm. uh, a UD junior, congratulations, thank almost you. done, uh, and a river steward and working with the Miami Valley Conservancy District mm -hmm. this summer. Uh, and thank all of you for watching LWV Empowering You. The League of Women Voters encourages everyone to participate in every election. If you have any further questions about this or upcoming programs, you can contact the League by emailing league at lwvdayton.org. You can mail us again, that's league at lwvdayton.org, or call our office at 937-228-4041. Thank you for sharing your time with us, and be well.